afternoon. Welcome to UPM. UPM is the Italian acronym for Popular Marian University. As its name indicates, it is a university that is intended for the general public rather than for specialists or for those who are working in the academe. So even if it is entrusted to a group of experts, its language and content is kept as simple as universal and as accessible to all as possible. The UPM was founded to give continuous formation, faith formation to the members of the Focolari movement. But of course, anyone who wants to participate is welcome. The courses are given in the light of the specific charism that God has given to its foundress, Kiara Lubick. The goal of the Focolari movement is to be able to contribute to the testament of Jesus that all may be one for a universal brotherhood. And for this reason, its members engage in dialogue at all levels, ecumenical dialogue, interreligious, intercultural, and all kinds of dialogue. They want to build bridges between persons, between groups, and in all areas of society. Incidentally, this year, we are um, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Kiara Lubick. If you want information regarding this celebration, you will find it in the internet, specifically in the websites of the Focolari movement all over the world. Now, our UPM course for this year is dedicated to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, which is the soul of the church and of the world. And our first lesson will be dedicated to spirit in the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Then it will be given to us by Father Rolando Garcia. Father Roli, as his friends call him, is a priest of the Archdiocese of Manila. He was ordained on September 28, 2002. He studied at San Carlos Seminary and pursued further studies on biblical theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. At present, he is spiritual director at the San Carlos Seminary and is also professor at the Theology Graduate School of the same seminary. He is also assistant um, secretary at the Apostolic Nunciature in Manila, and at the same time heads the uh, Ministry on Biblical Apostolate of the Archdiocese of Manila. Together with the Daughters of St. Paul, he hosts a program in Radio Veritas that is aired every Sunday evening called Ang Biblia Ngayon. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you Father Rolando Garcia. Good day. I am here to share with you a lecture given by Professor Janina Hebel on uh, November 10, 2018 at the International Center of the Focolare Movement. While I will remain faithful to the lecture given, because it is already well composed, I will take the liberty of inserting some points where I think a little contextualization or further explanation could help. The title of the lecture is Stormy Wind, Breath of Life, and a New Mindset, The Many Meanings of Spirit in the Book of the Prophet Ezekiel. While it is true that the concept of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was first made clear in the New Testament, it does not mean that the Trinity, especially the Son and the Holy Spirit, was not at work during the time of the Old Testament. People who lived in the Old Testament times would have not known the doctrine of the Triune God as we do today because there was a little understanding of him in that manner, 
However, they would surely have understood the power, wisdom, and strength of God, the Spirit of God. God worked in those days through the Spirit as His agent. And in Psalm 104 verse 30, for example, the psalmist prayed, Send forth your Holy Spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord also worked through the prophets. And uh, the prophets counseled the community of Israel. They rebuked her. They denounced the kings and the wealthy oppressors of the poor. They spoke about the Messiah, the mysterious anointed king who would one day come to redeem Israel. Today, we will get to know one of the prophets and the book attributed to him, Ezekiel. Professor Hebel divided her lecture into the following sections or outline. First, a brief introduction to the book of Ezekiel and its historical context. Second, the richness of the Hebrew word ruach. Third, the role of the spirit in Ezekiel's visions. Fourth, the breath of life in the valley of death. And fifth, the promise of a new spirit and of a heart of flesh. Let us proceed with a brief introduction to the book of Ezekiel and its historical context. Ezekiel is the one of the so-called major prophets. With 48 chapters, the book of Ezekiel is in fact the third longest prophetic book after Isaiah and Jeremiah. At the first glance, it is not easy to read even though it has a clear structure and its writings are of high literary quality, we find it quite difficult to read. In fact, a very few of us have the patience to read the entire book. But uh, I think this is a good occasion for us to get a little more knowledge about Ezekiel. As with all Old, Te Old Testament prophets, it will be helpful to know something about the historical context of the book. According to the majority of scholars, the bulk of the book of Ezekiel was written during the Babylonian exile. In, uh, it was written in Babylonia while uh, the prophet was in exile. At the beginning of the book, the prophet Ezekiel is presented as a priest from Jerusalem who was deported to Babylonia together with King Jehoiakim and a large group of influential people and craftsmen and who receives his calling to be a prophet precisely in exile. In order to appreciate the power of Ezekiel's message, we need to understand the historical significance of the Babylonian exile. What happened during that time? But since there is no time for us to discuss history right now, I will only give a brief overview. In a nutshell, the events at the beginning of the 6th century, especially in 587 BC, gave rise to a profound crisis for the people of Judah. And this for, from more than one point of view. It would have been the end of their world as they knew it. Why? What happened? The Babylonian Empire had established rapidly itself as the new superpower in the ancient Near East. And unwise political decisions of the kings of Judah led to the first siege of Jerusalem. And in 597 BC, this resulted in the above-mentioned deportations. Judah was no longer a kingdom. 
it became a province of the Babylonian Empire. And in 587 BC, the Davidic dynasty ended. There was no more a king of Israel or king of Judah. All this meant the total breakdown, not only of the political system, but of the religious structures as well. The Davidic dynasty, the promised land, the temple, the holy city, all this had all been symbols of divine promises. And now, they all had been taken away by an enemy, Babylon. Everything that could offer protection, security, and meaning had either collapsed or was in the hands of the enemies. All this would raise questions for the Judeans. Were they still the people of God? What does this mean? Had God abandoned them? Or had God been defeated by the Babylonian gods? What happened to us? Are we still the chosen people? We have no land. We have no temple. Do we still have a God? We are on the fourth month of the quarantine here, quarantine here in the Philippines. And many are saying that this worldwide health crisis caused by COVID-19 could be the worst event this generation could have experienced. The world as we know it ceased. And for many of us, it will be very difficult to go back to what we have been used to do. We are now forced to live our lives in the new normal. Is this our Babylonian exile? Maybe if we look into this as our own exile, it could be a good reason for us really to pay good attention to what the prophet Ezekiel is trying to tell us. Let us now proceed. The richness of the Hebrew word ruach, with examples from the book of Ezekiel. In order to talk about the Spirit of God in Ezekiel, we first need to gain some understanding of the richness of the word ruach. This word, which is grammatically feminine in Hebrew, can be translated spirit, but it has much broader range of meanings. Ezekiel, who has been called the prophet of the Spirit, employs all the possible meanings of this word. Here are some examples. The basic meaning of ruah could be air in movement or wind. Elsewhere, the book mentions the east wind. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, wind like fire and other forces of nature, is almost always associated with the Lord's judgment. So, wind. A second meaning of the word ruah is direction. We can see this, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 10, where God announces, I will execute judgments on you, and any of you who survive, I will scatter to every wind. This means people will be scattered in every direction towards every point of the compass. So, direction. Moreover, ruach can also signify breath, the third meaning. And thus is precisely what distinguishes a living being from a corpse. And we shall see this in Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 to 14. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. 
fourth, when it refers to a human being, ruach also denotes the willpower, the emotions, the courage, the attitude of a person. In this sense, it can be translated as spirit or mind. So together with the heart, the spirit is the seat of deep convictions, thoughts, and decision-making, the inner life of a person. And lastly, in analogy to the spirit of a human person, we can also talk about Ruach as the spirit of God. Of course, in the Old Testament, this does not mean the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian sense that we are used to as Christians. Spirit of God means the thoughts of God, the power of God, even the breath of God. And so in this sense, it indicates God's spoken words. And the Spirit of God gives life strengthens, renews, communicates God's thoughts, it commissions, and inspires people. It is a divine energy, just like the human spirit is a human energy. So at the same time, it is a way of God's being present in the world and present with His people. So air in movement or wind Direction, breath, spirit or mind, or spirit of God. These are the meanings of Ruach, which Ezekiel employed in his book. And this uh, Ruach would have a very important role in all the four visions in the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Let us go to the third point, the role of the Spirit in Ezekiel's visions, which is preparatory power and means of transport, stormy wind. The book of Ezekiel contains four vision accounts. Three are longer, chapters 1 to 3, chapters 8 to 11, chapters 40 to 48, and one is a short narrative, a very short one, chapter 3, verses 22 to 27. These vision accounts contribute to the overall structure and cohesion of the book. And one of the elements in common is precisely the work of the spirit or wind or breath, ruach. A spirit or wind often appears at the beginning or end of the vision, together with the hand of the Lord. And this spirit or wind lifts the prophet up and takes him to the location of the vision. So sometimes this spirit would transport the, the prophet from Babylon to the temple or from the temple back to Babylon. So we can observe that an indefinite spirit functions as a mysterious means of transport from Jerusalem to Babylon. No? And it is the Spirit of God. It is this Ruach, the Spirit of God. And it is a divine force. It has a, an origin which is divine. So... This phenomenon also occurs in the middle of the visions. For example, in chapter 42, verse 5, during the second temple vision, Ezekiel said, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. So, all in all, we could say that this transforming, uh, transporting spirit has the function of a catalyst in as much as it creates the conditions for the unfolding of the vision to take place. But there is yet another function of the Spirit in the context of Ezekiel's vision. On two occasions, Ezekiel finds himself prostrated to the ground. 
chapter 1 verse 28 and chapter 3 verse 23. And Ezekiel was on the ground entirely overwhelmed by the appearance of the glory of the Lord. And when God commands him to stand up, the prophet does not seem to be able to do so. So, what did God do? The Spirit entered into him and set him on his feet. Here, Ruach acts on the prophet not externally but inside, entering into him. So, in summary, when we look at the, the visions of Ezekiel, the Spirit or the Ruach acts as a mysterious and irres irresistible force of divine origin which functions as a kind of spiritual means of transport. And then also on two occasions, this Ruach enters into the prophet so as to strengthen him, enabling him to stand on his feet. And we can therefore see an important role of Ruach in preparing and facilitating Ezekiel's visions. So that's the first function of the Ruach, a preparatory power and means of transport, a stormy wind. The fourth, fourth point, the Ruach is the breath of life in the valley of death. Perhaps the best known and most daring vision in the book of Ezekiel is that of the resurrection of the dry bones. It is a true rhetorical masterpiece. Since it is not very long, let us read it together. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon this lane, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says 
the Lord. The translation of uh, the NRSV that we just read uses three different English words for the various occurrences of the word ruach in this text. But huh, using this uh, different meanings, the author subtly but clearly distinguishes five roles of the ruach in these 14 verses. First, the spirit, the power of the Lord in association with the visionary transport of the prophet, ruach, is connected to the divine name, the spirit of the Lord. Second, breath, no? breath in the sense of physical life. Third, the, bre the breath of life, the life force that animates all living creatures. A personified force that is somehow divine, but also distinct from God. And that can be addressed by the prophet and works the miracle of reviving the reassembled bodies written no? in uh, verse 9. The four points of the compass, and lastly, the Spirit of the Lord, promised as a gift to the house of Israel. So here we see the richness of the word ruach. But the real starting point of the vision is not the beginning, but verse 11, which quotes the exile's statement of despair. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. The vision does not contradict this. On the contrary, by showing a great quantity of scattered, dried-up bones, it further emphasizes the situation of the death. The question that God asked the prophet might seem almost cynical. Will these bones live? Ezekiel's response leaves it open. Lord God, you know. The solemn and extremely detailed promise which God then makes to the bones, twice announces that Ruach will enter them. And both times this is followed immediately by, and you will live. My spirit will enter and you will live. In the logic of the vision, God promises what is necessary to restore life to the bones. And, however, the promise does not culminate in the announcement of new life, but in a formula which recurs frequently in the book of Ezekiel. And you will know that I am the Lord. Verses 11 to 14 apply the vision to the situation of the exiles. Yes, they are indeed like dead bones, scattered and dried up. But God can give them life again. Just as God promised to the bones all that was necessary to recompose them as bodies, so God promises to the exiles all that is necessary to recompose them as people, to leave them out of their graves, out of exile, and to bring them back to their own land. However, Ending the exile would not be enough to make the dead come back to life. Once again, the promise of Ruach recurs, but what is promised here is not the ordinary natural life breath common to all living things. What is promised is the Spirit of God Himself. And once again, the promise of Ruach is followed by the same words, now resonating in a much deeper meaning. You will live and you will know that I am the Lord. Indeed, the Spirit of God recreates the life of God's people and renews their relationship with God. We are now on the last point. The promise of a new spirit and of a heart 
of new flesh, which Professor Hevel would say, the new mindset. The promise of the Spirit of God can be found also in other chapters of the book of Ezekiel. Particularly interesting are the twin texts, Ezekiel chapter 11 verses 19 to 20, and chapter 36 verses 26 to 27. Not unusual for Ezekiel, this, uh, the two verses are almost identical. In both, God promises a new spirit alongside a change of heart from the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Let, let us look at the texts. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 to 28. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors. You shall be my people and I will be your God. In these two texts, the Ruah certainly is used in the sense of spirit, willpower, thoughts, and mindset. The words heart and spirit are in parallel since also the heart is, in Hebrew anthropology, the seat of decision-making and reason as well as emotions. The new heart is further specified as a heart of flesh. And uh, it is given a new spirit. To give a new spirit, a new heart to a person means nothing less than to completely recreate that person's inner nature. Using a technological analogy, it could, it could be compared to changing both the hard drive and the motherboard of a computer. We need to be aware, however, that these texts do not speak of a single transformed person. In fact, both texts use the plural, you, they. What does this mean? The transformation is in view is not the transformation of a single individual, but primarily that of the people as a community. Huh? Just as it had been the community that profaned the Lord's name, committed idolatry and therefore suffered the Lord's judgment, the whole community will be given this new opportunity, this new life, new spirit, new flesh. Why is this profound trans transformation necessary? Because Ezekiel does not doubt that the Lord is the powerful and faithful God. It is the people who are not faithful. And in God's faithfulness, despite the people's hard-headedness, Ezekiel realizes that God will event eventually save them from exile. Out of concern for God's holy name and not due to any merit on the part of the people. And it is in this context that we should understand the metaphor of the new heart and a new spirit. The open heart surgery that God is going to perform will cure the fatal condition of having a heart of stone. It means a change in the mentality of God's people. A new mindset. The new spirit will enter into the community as a whole, thus enabling it to live according to.
to God's laws. So the people in exile receives a message of hope. Yes, you may feel dead at the moment you are in exile. But God in His goodness, God in His mercy will give you the Ruach, the new spirit, new heart, a new mindset. You are dead because you have hearts of stones. But the Lord will give you a new heart. In conclusion, we have seen that the Hebrew word ruach, often translated as spirit, is used with a wide range of meanings in the book of Ezekiel and in the Old Testament in general. In the Old Testament, to speak about the spirit of the Lord is a way of communicating God's presence in the world. The Spirit of the Lord is the agency through which God's will is exercised, whether it be in creation, His dispensing of life, His guidance and providential care, the revelation of His will, His salvation, His renewal of unregenerate hearts and minds, or His sealing of His covenant people as his own. And in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, this Ruach, as Professor Hevel summarized, we can name three functions or three actions of, the, of Ruach. First, as a stormy wind. In Ezekiel, the Spirit of God, at least a ruach of divine origin carries the prophets to and from the location, locations of his visions. And it also sets him on his feet in front of God so that God can speak to him. The ruach is also breath of life. In analogy to the life breath restored to the dead bones through the intervention of the personified source of life, the breath, spirit, the divine spirit is promised to the people of God who are similar to the dead without hope. The Ruach is a new mindset. The gift of the new spirit will guarantee compliance with the will of God, thus ensuring that judgment and exile will never happen again. So Ezekiel uses familiar theological traditions, for example, the idea of that the Spirit of the Lord gives life in a creative and inspired way. We need to keep in mind that Ezekiel lives during a time of great crisis, of political, theological, and social collapse. In these dramatic times, Ezekiel, who living more than 500 years before Jesus, knew nothing about a crucified Christ. But somehow he understands that the Spirit, the breath, the power of God can generate life from death. Without recourse to concepts like mercy and compassion, Ezekiel courageously formulates his idea of what we would call grace without using the word grace. He proclaims that God will save, not because of any human merits, but in order to vindicate God's holy name. This is one of Ezekiel's contributions to the important theological developments which will be the fruit of the Babylonian exile and will become part of the common heritage of both Judaism and Christianity. And from our vantage point from many centuries later, these developments certainly may appear as a process guided by the Holy Spirit. So my invitation for you as we no, come from this uh, experience of our own exile the quarantine caused by the pandemic, this would be a good occasion for us to read the book 
of the prophet Ezekiel and try to discover the hope that the prophet communicates. God will be there for you. God will share the ruach, whether as a stormy wind, a breath of life, a new mindset. It is a grace. A grace that would help us move on, move forward, and face the new normal. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Father Rolly, for this very interesting talk. You have made the prophet Ezekiel alive to us, and you have made us penetrate his vision. Thank you for explaining the meanings of spirit in his book. So for those who are listening, I'm sure you have many questions to ask. You have many comments to make. I suggest that you meet together in groups in these following days, and then send your questions and your comments to us through your group leaders or through the person who invited you to follow us. Our next appointment is on the third Sunday of July, July 19th, at the same time and in the same channel. Thank you for listening to us and God bless you.